Sure. Um, I guess my story is a, an unusual and also quite a usual one. Um, I was brought up in a quite a traditional household growing up. So kind of the same 10 meals on rotation, which was, you know, your shepherd's pie and your, your Sunday dinner and your spaghetti bolognese. So I grew up eating meat um, and I never really questioned anything about it until in 2015, my partner, Christina, and I moved to Cambodia for a bit of an adventure. And that really opened our eyes up to um, what eating meat, I guess, was all about. You know, you really see the animals hanging up in the market, um, which, you know, in, in the UK in supermarkets, you that link isn't really there for you to to understand what what it is but you you know say with chickens you see the chickens hanging up in in the market which really gave you like a visual reminder of what it was you were eating but the most important thing there was that culturally they ate dog meat so um a bit like here you know we eat beef and chicken as as normal um in Cambodia they eat they eat dog meat as normal. Uh, it's a cheap form of protein for them. It's quite a quite a um, poor country. So my colleagues where I worked who are the local Cambodians would come in with, you know, marinated dog meat and ask me if I wanted some, you know, almost as a joke. Um, but I, I found it shocking and um, awful. And as a result, that got me questioning. I think we went to India from there on, on a holiday where cows are sacred. And so that really got us thinking, you know, if, if we think eating dog meat is so awful and we just can't even imagine it, then why are we still eating cows and pigs and chickens? Um, coupled with that, there obviously isn't the same level of food safety in Cambodia as there is in the UK. So uh, both of us got pretty ill from eating meat on a couple of times. I had a tapeworm, um, like an intestinal worm. And at one point, I genuinely thought I was going to die from food poisoning because of um, a bit of meat that I'd had. I assumed that's what it was. So we gradually started going more plant-based. We started cutting out meat for both of those reasons. Um, and then this kind of coincides with the story of Do Good, which I'll talk about separately. But we we rescued a couple of dogs that were destined for the dog meat market. Um, we came back to the UK. And... I guess I continued cutting down meat, but not really um, eliminating it. And this is more like 2017, 2018. But as you start searching for more plant-based options, the kind of algorithms that, you know, suggest things to you start giving you more suggestions. So I started watching different documentaries um, and I was more interested in my health than anything else. So um, the one that did it for me was watching Game Changers. And I was training for marathon at the time, or I'd done a few half marathons. I was about to train for the London Marathon. And after watching Game Changers, which you know, showed you uh, you could have performance improvements from going fully plant-based, fully vegan, I decided to give it a go. So this was at the start of 2020, so only two and a half years ago. Didn't end up doing the marathon that year because of COVID, but um, I had such uh, felt such an improvement, particularly in my recovery um, from cutting out, you know, it wasn't just occasional meat, but it was cheese and dairy and things like that, that I just didn't really look back. Um, and uh, as, a, as a result, you know, as I said, it's coincided with starting a vegan business. Um, and now there's there's no going back really. I mean, I I feel fitter and healthier than ever. One thing I have discovered um, since joining various vegan groups is I just assumed that all vegans were you know whole foods, plant based, you know <laughs> virtuous, uh, healthy people. But it actually turns out that um, a lot of people still eat junk food. Um, that it's just um, not from animal products, which was actually quite surprising for me. Yeah, well, I'm, I must must confess, I'm I'm one of them. I'd like to say it was twenty percent of the time, but it might be a little bit more than that. We 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 will leave that one undisclosed. But uh, yeah, I I, I, t I totally. You know, I always think uh, those folks are the most hardcore because they're doing it for the ethics. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> there's 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 no health there's no health benefits here. It's <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, there is, but you 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 get you get the idea. <laughs> So, so tell us a little bit about Do Good. When, when did that sort of uh, cross paths with your, your journey into veganism? 
Yeah, it was kind of, it co-evolved. So when we started going more plant-based ourselves, as I mentioned, um, I was driving along one day and my, my partner had always wanted a beagle. This is something like I'd never had dogs growing up. She'd grown up with a dog, but she always wanted a beagle. Um, and I was driving along one day and at the side of the road, um, on what could have been the hottest day of the year was a beagle in a cage, um, that was being sold, we presume for dog meat. And what typically happens is there are no pet dogs in Cambodia. There are only dogs that are guard dogs, like big dogs for guard dogs and dogs that they eat for meat. So what happens is they have big puppy farms in Thailand. They, um, you know, sell them as pets there, Thailand being a bit more developed than Cambodia. And any that don't sell as pets get brought over the border in a van and sold in the markets essentially for meat because, um, you know, they're getting to the point where they can't be sold as puppies. So uh, I basically pulled over, called uh, my now fiance, but partner at the time and said, I've just seen a beagle in a cage. I know we've never had a dog before, but shall I, shall I basically rescue it? So that's how it started. I, I bartered at the side of the road for, for this dog. Um, and then she was a nightmare. She was a real street dog, you know, biting, chewing everything and peeing everywhere. And after three months, we thought, um, what should we do to, to kind of help this situation? We'll get another dog and then that will help and they can run around together. So we found a charity out there that were rescuing dogs that were for dog meat as well. So we ended up with two dogs. And because we were going less, uh, eating less meat and going more plant based, we and of having these kind of issues, you know, gastro issues and worms and all sorts, we thought, right, well, we better research what we can feed our dogs as well. Mm. So we did a lot of research and we learned that dogs are omnivores rather than carnivores and they don't need to eat meat, which is what we originally thought, and that they could thrive on a plant-based diet, not just survive. And um, we can talk separately about the evolution of dogs, but they've co-evolved humans over 30 to 40,000 years, eating a primarily kind of starch-rich diet with, you know, mm. occasional scraps of meat. So we thought it would be safer to cook for them there was no commercial dog food out there you know dry food right. that you could buy on a supermarket so we essentially gave dogs what people have been giving dogs for thousands of years which is table scraps and it was more plant-based for us when we came back to the uk we brought the dogs back with us um, their flight actually cost more than ours believe it or not and they uh, they went in the hold and um and we landed back in the uk so this was 2017 and going to the supermarket to see what to feed the dogs. Um, as I mentioned, never had a dog in my life, never grown up with dogs. And because I told you I'm quite into my health and nutrition, I always yeah. read the labels. So I had a look at what was on offer in the supermarkets, the, the dry food. And I discovered this ingredient called uh, animal derivatives. So I thought, what are animal derivatives? So I search for it and find out what it is. And it turns out animal derivatives is essentially leftovers from the slaughterhouses. So anything that uh, humans can't or won't eat is ground down into um, a paste, essentially, that can be extruded, added to other ingredients and extruded out into dried dog food. So when I say um, slaughterhouse leftovers, it includes things like ground down skulls, beaks, hooves, hair, bristle even placenta and semen so i thought i'm not feeding my dogs that no mm. way <laughs> and so we continued to cook for our dogs um we tried a couple of fresh options on the market in the uk that were all meat based but we didn't really want to be bringing meat mm. into our homes particularly when we were we went fully vegan so while we were home cooking we're doing a lot more research about how to create nutritional nutritionally complete diets for dogs and it's really difficult to get it um, right on your own because dogs don't have the necessarily have the benefit of humans of eating a very varied diet they tend to eat the same thing every day um, especially with dog food that you you know you you can mm. buy commercially so um, we decided um, we would try and start this for ourselves we, we looked for a plant-based option fresh plant-based option it didn't exist so we thought, well, 
let's start this ourselves. And it was actually coincided with the, with the pandemic happening. And we were both in corporate jobs, both didn't have a lot of time, both a bit dissatisfied with, you know, our, our current trajectories and decided, you know, my passion now in my life was my dogs and my plant-based eating. So why, why not combine the two? So we ended up teaming up with a canine nutritionist who was an expert in formulating the recipes to be nutritionally complete and balanced. But also because this is, was a brand new category and it being homemade, like sh- essentially going to be cooked by chefs, we needed to, um, we actually ended up teaming up with a, a, a chef who had a Michelin star from a previous restaurant. <laughs> and wow. we combined the two because you had the, the nutritionist would be saying, right, um, we need to be creative here to give dogs the um, nutrients they need from plant-based sources rather than meat. So dogs need, for example, 10 essential amino acids, which are the building blocks of, of protein. You can get those quite easily from meat, but to get them from plant-based sources, you need to combine ingredients uh, in the right proportions to complete the amino acid profile. Um, so for example, we had to combine chickpeas with black turtle beans and hemp seeds in the right proportions um things need to be ground down for digestion but what we'd find is if she'd say right you you need x amount of the chickpeas you need x amount of hemp seeds then we're adding in other ingredients like sesame seeds or pumpkin seeds when we'd go to cook it it would be too dry you know so it's it's not palatable for dogs so we had to you know go to the chef and say what can we do to help make this more digestible or more palatable for dogs what do you would you recommend adding to improve the consistency so he'd recommend oh maybe try flaxseed oil and that might help you know soften everything up so that it's not so dry so we'd go back to the nutritionist well if you add more flaxseed oil it's going to help with omega 3s <laughs> but it's going to lower certain ing- so it took us about a year to develop the three recipes that we we finally launched at the end of september last year and uh we haven't looked back since um apart from being exceptionally complicated that process um (laughs) and it it sounds just mind-boggling like to to have got into it at at that sort of granular level of detail like you say working with these kind of two two folks you've got the nutritionist and the and the kind of the chef on one side that that's kind of you know that that in itself is is pretty complex but from the the point of view of then trying to make a a product that sits amongst other products that people are used to and and i'm talking from a price point uh of you because i could imagine like doing that is one thing but every every time you add in an ingredient you're probably hiking up the price and so on and you're competing with like you said, the the scraps from a slaughterhouse floor, which, which you know are essentially the the sort of quote unquote byproduct of of this this industry. So I imagine are a lot cheaper um, than than the, the kind of real high quality ingredients that you were trying to put in there. How how do you sort of square that particular circle, you know, and, and sort of tell that story if you like to a consumer? Yeah, I guess. Um... It is about education and empowerment to make a choice that benefits uh, the health of the consumer's dog, but also Mm. the health of the planet and the health of other animals. And it is about telling that story, as you mentioned. I mean, we're not ever going to try and compete with the very cheap um, supermarket own brand dry food, but we are benchmarked on price with some of the other freshly cooked meat based dog food um not the raw meat but the ones uh that uh, i think there's only two that i know of on the market that are meat-based chef cooked um and really we're we're trying to tell the uh, story of the benefits of fresh food over dry over processed food i mean it is quite an interesting uh history for dogs yeah that points to fresh food um i mean I feel like I've done a lot of research into this and, yeah. pe- you know, we are told as consumers that uh, dry processed food is what dogs truly need to thrive. But when you look at the history of it, I mm. certainly question that. Um, I mean, I can tell you a brief history of, of the to, yeah. evolution of dogs. Yeah, no, it is. It is quite interesting. So dogs evolved from wolves who were carnivores but we're going back 30 to 40,000 years ago 
and that's been um, kind of genetically tested that uh, dogs bones are found alongside human bones around up to 40,000 years ago and this is kind of coming out of the last ice age and we were still hunter gatherers so a long long time ago and uh, it was kind of the bolder more inquisitive wolves were sniffing around the early human campfires and uh, the ones that were kind of maybe more sociable or less aggressive were uh, domesticated at the time for guard dogs um, and probably to help hunting and over the last 30 to 40,000 years, they have kind of co-evolved with humans. So they've been eating scraps of what humans have been eating. Um, and primarily while we were hunter gatherers and then as we settled down to become arable farmers, which was maybe 6,000 years ago, um, we, were, um, we were naturally eating um, more plant-based foods um, and, and only meat, you know, when they were hunting and it was a, a high value but low um, probability um, mm. of you know eating meat from a hunt so essentially dogs uh, evolved from wolves um, and the ones that uh, early dogs that evolved uh, more efficient starch digestion had an advantage so they were likely to more likely to survive and pass those genes down to the next generation so um, and it introduced dogs to kind of grains and cooked foods rather than uh, carnivorous wolves needing to eat kind of raw meats, uh, fleshy meat. So, I mean, there's genetic studies that underpin this. There's a, a particular gene called AMY2B, which is uh, responsible for breaking down starch in and turning it into usable energy. Um, and dogs, our domesticated dogs, have 28 times more of this gene than wolves do, uh, uh, as, as an example. Wow. And, yeah, and... Um, there's also another study showing that the selection for that particular gene happened around 7,000 years ago, which was about the time we settled down as farmers. So it does show the coevolution. So this continued all the way through till probably the late 1800s of dogs being fed scraps from humans. And if you think until the last 100, maybe even 50 years, humans haven't been eating meat with every meals with every mm. meal you know it was a luxury even in the victorian times to have meat one time a week so dogs are very well evolved to derive their nutrition from plant-based sources uh, being on being biological omnivores and obviously we've got the beauty these days of um, having food technology to be able to replicate the specific nutrients they need from meat um, without having to give them the the actual ingredient uh, it, itself but what's really interesting is dogs had always just eaten human table scraps until uh, late 1800s when actually uh, it was an electrician who saw dogs uh, waiting for stale crackers being thrown from ships uh, on the docks of the River Thames <laughs> by the sailors. Um, and he saw those crackers, which are made from flour and water and a bit of salt as inexpensive, imperishable because they had, you know, they were there so that the sailors could use them for mm. long long boat journeys so he thought i'll turn this kind of concept into uh, dog food so he he marketed these crackers to english country gentlemen for their sporting dogs and that was the first commercial dog food end of the 1800s but only for like high society <laughs> that could afford it but then in 1918 which is at the end of um world war one there was a big surplus of horses because of the technological innovations. There were now cars and tractors. So uh, because there was a surplus of horses and therefore horse meat, this was put into cans and marketed as lean red meat for dog food with a very small disclaimer at the bottom that it was mm. horse meat, <laughs> a bit like we have now for animal derivatives. But uh, by 1941, the canned food was so successful, um, you know, Bearing in mind, it started from a surplus of horse meat, but it became so successful that um, producers of the dog food were breeding horses specifically for the dog food and slaughtering about 50,000 horses a year, oh which by today's standards is, is a small number from the global yeah. numbers we see. But at the time, you know, mm. 1940, that's a big number. And then companies had to innovate when we got to World War II because all the metal for the cans had to be sent for the war effort. So um, there was no longer kind of metal available for the canned horse meat. 
So what companies did to innovate was they found that by using the byproducts from cereal manufacturing and the slaughterhouse industry, they could produce like a shelf stable food that they could sell in bags that would then um, be a dry food on the supermarket shelves. Um, which created by a process called extrusion. So it takes the um, leftover ingredients, mashes them all together and heats them up into like a paste. It goes to about 320 degrees Fahrenheit and it's extruded through to make this dry food. So that attracted the larger corporations because they could see that it's cheap food, high profit margins, shelf stable. And so it was marketed to people as the only food that would be um, that dogs could really like thrive on and your, your dog should eat. So um, that was around 70 years ago. And if you think about it, dogs have evolved with us 30 to 40,000 years eating fresh food, eating mainly plant based food. And um, they certainly haven't had time to evolve in the last 70 years to eat over processed dry food. And this is now causing various health issues with dogs, a bit like it is with humans. You know, we're we're relying on these packet, yeah. packeted foods with additives, um, preservatives, and um, and it's it's not kind of giving them all the nutrients they need to to thrive. Or if they are added, they're destroyed during the processing. That's fascinating. So this whole notion that you know the sort of butcher's dog imagery that's kind of been given to us over the and I say given to us after you after hearing your your story, um, that that is essentially marketing, and 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 it, it's interesting how emotive that subject is now because uh, you know whenever I, I I've come across uh, either and there's not many but when I've come across anybody uh, talking about plant based dogs, vegan dogs, there's always uh, an emotive debate. <laughs> Shall we say, uh, in the comments sections of those articles on on the news, on the daytime TV programs, magazine shows, all those kind of things. So it's fascinating that that that's sort of taken root from essentially marketing, right? It, that's my belief, yeah. And from from all all the what I've researched, it's it is it has been marketed because if you look at that evolution, mm. the evolution dogs haven't evolved to eat dry processed food every day. But what they have evolved to eat is a mixed diet, um, which is freshly cooked. And as I said, with the benefits of our food technology nowadays, we can give them all the nutrients they need um, in the form that they, they've, always, they've evolved to eat it in um, to allow them to thrive. And what's quite interesting, as I mentioned, that dogs have co-evolved with humans um, in terms of our, what they've eaten because they've always been fed table scraps. So now they are facing the same health crisis that right. humans are facing. Wow. So obesity being the biggest one. Um, the, there was a study published in the veterinary record uh, a couple of years ago that they estimate that 75% of dogs in the UK are obese or overweight, which is a shocking number wow. to me because I, I genuinely can't believe that. I don't often look at a dog and think it's overweight, but this is what the studies are showing. So similar to humans, right? And if, you, if you're overweight, you're more likely to suffer with serious diseases. Um, with dogs, it'll be, uh, you know, things like diabetes and heart disease, but also joint pain, you know, because of being overweight. Um, and primarily, not just over-processed food, but certainly higher meat-based food. We know that meat has more high saturated fat and more cholesterol than plant-based and this is probably part of the reason humans are also uh, suffering their mm. obesity crisis and i've certainly found going going plant-based that my weight has gone down and and things like that but another shocking statistic is that one in four dogs will get cancer which again i i, I didn't know until i i um you know did a lot of research into it and we know as humans that cooking meat to high temperatures causes car carcinogens, which i.e. can help, can contribute towards causing cancers. So humans have stopped eating processed meats as much as possible and things like bacon and sausages are classed as, you know, carcinogens now with the World Health Organization and they're proven to cause obesity and cancers. Um, however, this hasn't really translated into the pet food industry yet. Uh, you know, dry food is still marketed as the best food and 
people that are, as you say, very emotional about dogs need meat, are feeding raw meat or are feeding uh, the, the dry food. Um, not just the, the, uh, the meat itself being high in saturated fat, but if you think about high processing, um, it destroys a lot of the, the nutrients that mm-hmm. would protect you from things like that. So, um, you know, vitamins A, B, E vitamins, omega-3s, they, they're all destroyed around 100, 120 degrees, but the, the canned food certainly is heated to, uh, I believe, 164, 120 degrees for, uh, I believe it's six hours. And the, especially the dry food is um, processed 160 degrees through an extruder, really high temperatures and pressures. So we freshly cook um, and we use the optimum method to cook each ingredient because it, we want to preserve those nutrients. So let's take kale, for example, we steam it. So it's really gently cooked and all of the minerals and nutrients that are in there are, are preserved. Um, the other thing to say is that this is another thing I found out from um, from looking into dog food and, and the, particularly the labeling and the marketing side of things. When you see a dog food that says with beef or with chicken, mm-hmm. it only has to contain 4% of huh. beef or chicken. And as we know, the 4% can be <laughs> bristle, placenta, hooves, hair, feathers. So, it's not how people imagine, uh, like a, wow. you know, a hearty chunk of, um, you know, prime steak. It, it is byproducts and it only needs to be 4% to say contains that. So for us, it, it, and this is why I never wanted to, to feed my dog the dry food is because I see this as like the dog equivalent of junk food. Yeah. Um, like, you know, eating cornflakes or crisps with every meal. Um, and I truly didn't think my my dogs would be able to thrive on that food and indeed i think studies have shown um there's two studies now in particular where dogs fed a vegan diet have lived on average one and a half and two years longer than the dogs fed a meat-based diet so it's just going back to your original um original point it is very emotive for people because we've been told dogs need meat and people believe dogs need meat Um, however the history and the evolution shows the opposite actually and um dogs need a specific set of nutrients not a specific set of ingredients we can get those from plant-based sources you can have all of the beneficial um advantages of plant-based like higher fiber polyphenols things like that which you won't get from uh, a very highly processed meat-based dry food or canned food so for, for us, um, and indeed, we can talk about some of the other studies on the benef- benefits of the vegan diets that have all been coming out recently, but it's becoming really clear that having eating fresh plant-based food is the best way to go for a dog's health, a bit like it is for a human's health. Wow. And as it stands, we're, we're the only fresh plant-based dog food on the market at the moment. And... Uh, Hopefully not the only one in the future. I mean, no one likes competition, but the more there are of us, the more that message is pushed because, um, you know, we still believe dogs needed to eat meat until a few years ago. And, Mm. you know, your average Joe still believes that. And and even most vegans will still believe that as well because that's what the big corporations have told you because it it is, um, it is, more profitable to sell something that is from a subsidized industry already and it's the leftovers and then they can process it highly and and it can be shelf stable. I mean, what we're doing is not, uh, it's not the cheapest way to produce something because (laughs) there's human intervention rather than Mm. it being processed Mm. at a factory. Um, and we have to preserve it by blast freezing it as soon as it's cooked rather than, uh, heating it to such high temperatures to kill the microorganisms. But, uh, but, killing the nutrients at the same time we have to gently cook then blast freeze and then we store it frozen and we deliver it uh, in insulated packaging and then the the end user would store that in their freezer and you know it is more premium all the ingredients are um, more premium but we believe are more functional and there is a bit of a hidden cost in the cheaper dry food because um, 
well, again, we can talk about studies in a moment, but um, studies have shown that if you feeding your dogs the meat based dry food, you're more likely to have more visits to the vet. So there is a wow. hidden cost there, as we know how much it costs mm-hmm. to if your dog needs to go to the vet. So, um, you know, if your health of your dog is important, um, I truly believe you should be uh, considering at least um, trying fresh plant based food for your for your dog. Let's get into that a little bit further then, because my perception was certainly, even as a as a vegan for five and a bit years, my, my perception was uh, vegan dog food would be not bad for your dog, um, probably pretty good, but w- would it be optimal? Would you be thriving? I, I, I wouldn't. You know, I'd like to have thought yes, but I probably didn't know one way or the other. And if somebody, uh, if somebody from uh, marketing at one of the big, the big companies had said to me, "Oh, for this, this, and this reason, dogs need to eat meat," I'd have probably gone, oh, "Okay, I'll bow to your knowledge," sort of thing. Um, uh, so I'm fascinated by this. This that there's actually studies that show the opposite. So let's get into that. Sure. Yeah. And um, at least three have come out in the last three months, and that's been great because there's only ever been eight uh there was only ever been five in total and three of i think with uh humans going more plant-based there's more interest in this area so they've Mm. started doing more studies on it which is which is fab but vegan dog food or plant-based dog food isn't a new thing and it has been recommended by vets for years without calling it vegan dog food it's actually been um been recommended as hypoallergenic or non-allergen um dog food for dogs that have allergies And that's because five out of the seven um, allergens for dogs are meat and dairy. Uh, So things like pork and beef and um, and lamb, they're causing um, allergies in dogs. So people that have an allergic dog would typically by the vet be recommended to be put on a specific hypoallergenic food, which is actually a plant based food. The other two being I think it's soy and wheat, which are plant based, which are um, our food doesn't contain either of those either, but it's not a new thing. Um, it, it, it's great for dogs with allergies, but in terms of the most recent studies, um, the largest one ever conducted was um, the, the findings were just released in April this year, and that followed two and a half thousand dogs over the space of a year, and that concluded that um, so out of these sorry out of these two and a half thousand dogs some were fed a conventional meat-based diet so like a dry food can diet some were fed a raw meat diet Mm -hmm. and some were fed a vegan diet and the study concluded um, what it did was it measured um, various things health indicators such as um, number of trips to the vet um, any particular chronic conditions and whether they got better or worse over time um owner reported um, health indicators such as the quality of stools which is every dog owner's favorite topic um, and you know energy levels things like that and the study concluded over uh, the space of a year that the healthiest and least hazardous diet for dogs were the nutritionally complete vegan diets so that was the study that was a bit of a game changer for um for, for us and for the other um, vegan dog food brands, because it made national news. It was in all the big papers. It was on Good Morning Britain. It was on Radio mm. 4, you know, and it was um, it was it was really good to finally shine a light on um, on the on vegan dog food and, and, and start that conversation. So since that study, as I mentioned, two others have come out um, in quick succession. Uh, the first one showed that uh, dogs on a plant-based diet lived on average two years longer than uh, the dogs on the non-vegan diet and were more likely to enjoy good health throughout their life and not suffer from chronic conditions. And then the second study demonstrated that within three to 12 months of transitioning dogs from a meat-based to a plant-based diet, it improved a multitude of different um, conditions, everything from kind of gastrointestinal issues to aggression, uh, anxiety, um, and things like that. So those have both been great. But I think there are, as I mentioned, there's eight studies out now um, 
that have compared meat-based and and plant-based diets seven out of those eight now support the use of nutritionally mm. sound vegan diets uh one that didn't i believe was from 1988 and only followed eight dogs and it sounded like it was quite an unnatural experiment where they put dogs on a treadmill and uh asked them to sprint for hour for an hour then stop and um i i don't know the exact outcome but i believe it was measuring um a couple of the dogs on the vegan diets had anemia or something like that but that's the only one but my favorite study which actually shows the opposite was with uh, siberian sprint racing huskies right. and i love this because um very few dogs have greater energy needs than siberian sprint racing huskies i mean they have to drag sleds for miles and miles and hours on end um, and during competitive racing, they have to do that for day, for days on end. So in this study, what they did was they fed six uh, huskies on one, one kind of sled racing team, uh, a meat-based diet, and they fed another six a completely vegan diet. And over 10 weeks of competitive racing, they um, did they took blood and they did vet assessments of both sets of dogs. And what they concluded at the end bearing in mind that no dog in your household will ever need to um, run as far or pull as much or, you know, as expend as much energy as this. What they found was that the, um, the vegan dogs and the meat-based dogs were both in excellent physical condition. There was no difference. No dogs developed anemia. And on the contrary, the red blood cell counts and the hemoglobin values of both dogs increase significantly, obviously, because they are increasing in their fitness as they as they progress through the competitive racing season. So um, to anyone that would say, you know, if I feed my dog a plant based diet, it's going to, you know, go limp and die and not have any energy. I'd say just have a look at this study. If you if you Google it, you'll find it. Um, it's a peer reviewed study, as are the other ones I've mentioned. Mm. And, you know, that shows you that if a Siberian Husky that is um, pulling sleds for miles on over to the course of 16 weeks can thrive on a plant based diet, then um, your little cockapoo that's in your yeah. in your house definitely can too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just incredible. Like, like, like I said, the my perception was, you know, not bad for dogs. It was certainly wasn't at the end of the scale of thriving Siberian husky level of of of, uh, of energy. So that's just it's just remarkable. Like and and it it makes me think uh, it's interesting. Like you said earlier, that there's there's these studies happening because it sort of suggests that there's a there's some desire somewhere to maybe disprove what we've been told for for a number of decades now that what dogs need is is you know a lot of meat basically mm. yeah i yeah i i mean I, I i wouldn't necessarily say that it's trying to disprove but i think there's just more interest in it um mm. because yeah. um there's a kind of trend towards humanization of our companion animals. Um, you know, mm. they say they've gone from living outside to coming into the house to now sleeping on the bed with us. So I think that any, any trend or, you know, any movement that's happening with, with humans transitioning right. to yeah. more plant-based is, ha is happening with, um, is of interest with dogs. And probably the most, I, I'd say it's also, it's fundamentally important um, for the, the future and, you know, from what I've just described, in, in my humble opinion, uh, from what I've, you know, researched and really delved into, I believe that the, we, we're in a dog health crisis, as mm. I mentioned, the pet food industry is unsustainable for, um, you know, the lives of other animals, but it's the environmental impact that is probably the most salient issue of the day for um, people that aren't necessarily vegan, but they are reducing their meat consumption sure. for the environment. And there are some very shocking statistics around the impact that your um, your pet dog uh, has on the environment that people don't realize. So, um, and again, I didn't know any of this until I really, really, you know, went down rabbit holes, um, you know, searching for it. Mm. So animal agriculture, we know as a whole, is mm -hmm. responsible for 
around 15% of the global emissions that contribute towards climate change. But from a study I've read, that could be up to 87% if you count all the deforestation that occurs as well. Um, but from what I understand, um, half of our kind of one and a half degree uh, budget that we've got, you know, to f to limit the uh, climate change um, global warming to is taken up by animal agriculture. So half of that budget is just from animal ag ag agriculture. And so avoiding meat and dairy is the biggest way that we can personally reduce our environmental impact. And I think that message resonates with, um, you know, the mainstream now and um, mm -hmm. meat eaters who are reducing their meat intake. But what people don't realize is the pets uh, or their companion animals impacts on, on climate change as well. So a study was done, again, peer-reviewed, open source study done in 2018, which found that meat-based pet food is responsible for 25 to 30% of that impact of animal agriculture as a whole. So 15% of the global climate change, 25 to 30% of that is pet food, wow. which is not a small amount. So, you know, that's, that's a quarter of animal agriculture, everything from the land use the water use, the fossil fuel emissions, the pesticide use. And we know what a big impact that is because we've all watched the documentaries on it. Mm. Um, and even though people think, yeah, oh, but it's the leftovers from the slaughterhouses, so there might not be, you know, there might, why would it be 30%? But um, it's estimated now that about 30% of livestock is now reared specifically just for pet food. And that's because of these premiumization trends right. happening where people want high quality meat for their dogs and the, the raw meat um, kind of segment of the market as well. So just some really shocking statistics. Um, an area twice the size of the UK is now feeded just to feed the world's pets. So that's the amount of oh, land yeah. they need. Um, dogs, this is the one that I loved, which is dogs in the USA consume as many calories as the entire population of France, which is a crazy huh. statistic. Wow. So you, see, it's, you can see how it's a huh. big impact. So there have been some studies on this as well. Um, one particular study found, um, this was done in Japan, and it found mm. that the average dog in Japan has a larger environmental paw print than the average person in Japan which uh, really? is quite quite yeah. shocking huh. but you might think well maybe a japanese person has a um has a smaller environmental footprint than you know the western meat heavy diet but if you think about a typical kind of family dog in the uk so like a golden retriever they need 1500 calories a day which is about the same amount of calories as is recommended for a woman uh, or a you know a child or a smaller human being so um if that dog is fed a predominantly new meat-based diet, and in the case of a raw meat diet, the, a golden retriever can have a higher environmental uh, footprint or paw print than you as a human can mm. just from the food alone. So um, what we've been trying to educate people on is that your, your dog um, has a huge environmental impact, um, much, much, much more than you think. And if you teamed up with them to eat plant-based for one day, then you together, you would both save 10,000 litres of fresh water, 60 square feet of rainforest, enough fossil fuel to drive 92 miles, which is the one that really gets me because that's, mm. that's a big old commute, um, as well as two animals' lives. And so for the mainstream that, you know, still uncomfortable feeding their dogs, um, you know, entirely plant-based, if you just mix this 50-50 with their current food, you're half their environmental pore print. If you're doing meat-free Mondays or you're doing a couple days meat-free a week because that's all you're comfortable doing yourself, just do that with your dog as well. Um, and just just use it as a topper on, on top of their meat-based food. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, the studies, you know, I think these are being done because it's we're getting to a crunch point with the environment um you know as i said we're getting to a crunch point with um dog health crisis like we are with human health crisis so all these issues and it's no wonder we've we've co-evolved with dogs so it's no wonder that they're facing the same issues that, that we're facing and you know it's all our, our our earth to live on so that was really why we we launched and it you know we launched as a, a male male 
an amalgamation of, of my passions. But it's what it's really evolved into is a, a mission to disrupt that meat based pet food industry, which we see as fundamentally unsustainable for dog health, for uh, environmental reasons, as well as for animal welfare and the kind of the growing concerns around all of those areas. And we truly believe that if we if we don't start feeding our dogs more plant based, we might not have a choice soon, mm. you know, a bit like with, with us as humans, if we don't start eating more plant based. And I'm talking about mainstream um, audience here. I'm, you know, all, all yeah. vegans will be, be doing that already. But um, but I think the uh, one of the statistics I read was 90 or around 90, 95 percent of plant based products as in like fake meat burgers are, are eaten by meat eaters so um for us the the audience for us to educate there is the mainstream who are um reducing their meat consumption but are never going to cut it out completely and encouraging them to do the same for their dogs from the environmental standpoint because you might think that your as i mentioned earlier your cockapoo or your golden retriever or your labrador is just a dog that's not having much of an impact but really they're having as much if not a greater impact than yourself especially if they're fed a hundred percent meat diet wow it's, it's an incredible mission to have gone on steve and you're you're so well equipped from a research standpoint to have these conversations and they are complex and emotive in the mainstream absolutely how have people responded to to you and do good and you know what's what's the future looking like for the for the company and and the wider marketplace of vegan dog food sure it's been a really interesting evolution because as i mentioned we we took a year to develop products we took a year to really delve into that story and learn and be confident that this was the you know this was needed and all you know vital for the world and also solving a problem um but when we first launched in september last year our customers were primarily vegan um we know that because we had a close relationship with the first you know bunch of customers like the early adopters um and whenever we did facebook ads we'd get the same message back of dogs need meat, this is animal mm. abuse, report this guy, you know, all that kind of thing. But what we've really seen, and uh, well, when that happened, which is great, we did have counter arguments from, you know, other people saying dogs can thrive on plant-based. Did you know the oldest dog that ever lived that was in the Guinness Book of World Records was fed a vegan diet, which is another amazing fact. Um, mm lived to the age of 25, a border collie from the UK, which is like 189 in, uh, in human wow. years, if you convert <laughs> them, fed a vegan diet for their whole life. Um, so initially, yeah, we'd get the kind of kickback and then, but people would support it. But what we're finding now is that, um, that viewpoint is almost becoming less existent. It's not non-existent, but it's becoming less existent that I think because it's, because there are more studies, because it's in the news more. Um, we were filmed for Channel 5 last week for Secrets of Your Supermarket Shelves. So again, that will be national, um, you know, on, shown to a national audience that um, vegan diets for dogs are safe. Um, they have lots of benefits and it's been proven in studies and why it's needed for the environment and for dog health as well. So in terms of the future, there, there has been a really recent uh, Mintel report, like research report, mm. which is showing that, uh, what, that you know, where they, um, where they interview uh, or study people, what do you call it? They um, survey, that's the one, they survey people. And the, out of people surveyed, uh, one yeah. in three um, responded that they believed it was no. good for pets to regularly have a plant-based meal instead of a meat-based one. That really shocked me because... I did not believe one in three would think that. And that actually rose to three in five for Gen Zs. So you're know, talking 60% of Gen Zs said it was good for pets, pets to regularly have uh, plant-based meals. So we think it's all going in the right direction in terms of um, consumer awareness. Um, and it really is awareness that dogs can thrive on plant-based food and being comfortable to feed your dog plant-based food. So it's definitely a growth industry 
as a whole in the UK, there were 9 million dogs in the UK before the pandemic. And then with all the, the lockdown puppies um, purchased, there are now all rescued. There are now 12 million dogs in the UK. So there is a, a growing market as well. And the, the, the market trends are really towards, as we mentioned, humanization of dogs, but also premiumization. And that is because consumers are learning about the benefits mm. of fresh food, real ingredients, and not over-processed, um, essentially filler, filler ingredients that uh, can cause issues in dogs from, you know, cancers to inflammation and things that are going to lead to more trips to the vet. So, um, look, we launched at the, the end of last year. We're still very much a scrappy startup. Um, we're, we're slowly growing our customer base of um, subscribers. So we work on a subscription model. We deliver food in insulated boxes from once every two weeks to once every eight weeks. Um, the customer stores it in the freezer. Um, we're still self-funded. Um, we, we've been you know, doing this through our passions, but we're at the point now where we, we're looking for external funding because we, we need to We've got the right product at the right time. We've got the right message, which is needed for dog health, needed for you know environmental and animal welfare. And so um, for us, the future is looking really bright. And we're really excited to, if we look back, you know, two years working in corporate jobs, not particularly feeling satisfied to where we are now. Um, it's you know not without its challenges and uh, stress and strain and you know we're, we're thinking about it all hours of the day and working seven days a week but um we're doing something we're really passionate about and we think is really needed in the world so we're really positive and um, optimistic about the future for not just do good as a company but vegan dog food as a whole more power to you steve it's an incredible mission to be on and, and it's been an absolute pleasure and an education to to chat with you today um it would be remiss of us not to tell folks where to find out a little bit more and perhaps pick up some uh, uh as well get a subscription actually to uh to do good so where, where would folks go sure so our website is we are do good.co.uk uh, and then we're on facebook and instagram our handle is at we are do good excellent and i'll pop a link in the show notes for folks as well so do head there excellent steve it's been a pleasure thank you so much for your time i know you're a busy man so i appreciate it uh, and and more power to you as i said thank you so much thank you cheers jim 